When the moon hangs high in the midnight sky Like a cat's claw scratching down And the wolves, they do howl For they smell something foul Mr. Whiskers has come to town He trundles out of the dark Looking for a lark You better pray you don't catch his eye For when he is done having his fun You just might wish you could die <laughs> Well, it looks like that storm is really not quieting down out there. Oh, well, as your host, Mr. Whiskers the Mad Catter, I have no qualms with letting you stay another night. Besides, that gives us time to finish our story from before. Now, pour yourselves a cup of tea. I find that rum goes well with black tea myself, though it is a bit late for that. Ah, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Anyway, before we get into things, I figure I should point out that we have received another review. Remember, kitties, review the show to help us grow. Oh, that rhymed. The more reviews, the more those algorithms will push this show to the forefront of searches for good horror fiction podcasts. So give Twisted Tea Time five stars on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your delightful little audio fixes. Now, this one is from someone named Squid238. <clears throat> Very well done. I really have a lot of fun listening to this podcast. The host does a great job with the intro, very tales from the cryptish. He also does a great job of bringing the stories to life. I'm always glad to see a new episode pop up in my feed. Well, thank you, Squid238. I do so admire the Crypt Keeper. Such a sense of humor that old bag of bones has. Though his voice is a bit grating on the nerves. And what is with that laugh? <laughs> now, when last we visited the back paths, our heroes had taken... Now, when last we visited the back paths, our hero had taken a long jog along the wooded paths between the various apartment complexes in his neighborhood, only to find things weren't quite what they seemed. The path didn't quite have the same dimensions, he remembered, and he got lost in what should have been a fairly straightforward jogging path. And then, there seemed to be something within Something following him. Something very hungry. Well, barely escaping the paths, he heard the cry of a little girl. The same little girl who had just recently gone missing from his apartment complex. So, rather than leave her to whatever had been hunting him... He recruited one of his neighbors, a metalhead named Mike, to assist him in the hunt, and together they returned to the back paths. The place was different this time, more maze-like, and though they found the girl, they couldn't find their way back home. Finally, they made an exit with the judicious use of a sledgehammer. And... Just as the world turned quite literally upside down, they find their way back to the apartment complexes. Of course, something was off. The place seemed devoid of life, abandoned even. Upon arriving at his apartment, our protagonist noticed strange papers tacked upon all the doors, all labeled Glorwalk. G-L-O-R-W-O-C. It's then that he and his companions realize they are not in their own world, but some alternate dimension. 
And that, dear kitties, is where we rejoin our odd trio as we delve back into the second half of Matt Dimersky's The Back Paths. The Back Paths, Act Two, by M59 Gar, otherwise known as Matt Dimersky. Chapter Three Creeping Silence. With no immediate danger present, we took refuge in a rare apartment not marked with the strange postings. There was no furniture inside, as if nobody had lived there for quite some time. Peering through the blinds and out into the calm night, I couldn't help feeling that any measure of safety we might find would merely be a comforting illusion. The only room in the house with no windows lay on the second floor, a long, narrow bathroom. Mike searched for the light switch in the darkness and flicked it with relief. Lights work. Yeah, but why? I asked, not willing to trust any beneficial turn of events, no matter how small. And the automatic lights out in the carports work, too. Got me. He carried the little girl to the bathtub and told her gently to try to sleep. After closing and locking the door, I turned the faucet experimentally. Nothing happened. No water, but maybe it's just because nobody was living here. We both slumped on opposite sides of the narrow space. What do you think Glorwalk is? He asked, trying to pronounce the word we'd seen posted on the doors of apartments we very much did not want to enter. Glorwalk. Maybe it stands for something. I shook my head, gazing absently at my shoes, and at the under-sink cabinets against which they rested. My pants were still soggy from the rains in the back paths, but I wasn't about to feel even more vulnerable in this eerie place. And where was it exactly? My apartment key worked, and my car was outside in a nearby carport. The buildings all looked right as far as we could tell at night. Was this another dimension? A parallel world where something terrible had happened? If so, what? And if this was another world, then how would we ever get back home? How would we ever know which gap was the right one? Would the back paths let the guiding wire we laid remain? I doubted it. Unanswered questions plagued me as I reclined against the wall, half asleep for some interminable time. A jolt brought me fully awake. Listening to the distant vibration, I tried to place it, but couldn't recognize it. Also woken up, Mike blinked and looked at me with tired, bloodshot eyes. Stay here, I said, groaning and standing. I'm going to go look around. Shouldn't I come with you? We can't leave her here alone. He nodded unhappily. I'll be careful. I crept out without another word, closing the bathroom door behind me. Eyes wide, ears alert, I let my senses drink in the faint early morning light. The barest blue hue vaguely outlined the empty rooms to my left and right. I approached the closet in each slowly, taking one step at a time, making absolutely no noise. I heard nothing, and swung each closet open with a jump of apprehension, but found nothing. With the second floor clear, I moved down the stairs, cringing at each painfully loud creak, finding nothing in the kitchen or the living room, 
I reluctantly decided to call the apartment safe, at least for the moment. Cracking open the blinds just a tiny bit, I looked out. The wan pre-dawn blue revealed barely more than it hid. Impenetrable shadows ran long and confusing across the grass islands, bushes, sidewalks, and cars outside. The scenery was made only more confusing by the intermittent lampposts shining small pockets of orange on their surroundings. Sliding out the front door we'd bashed in, I closed it carefully behind me. The first that struck me was the clean, sweet feel of open air. The day was cool, but refreshing, and I would have called the weather amazing at any other time. Dark clouds ran corrugated across half the sky, but the other half formed a vault of dim incandescent blue overhead. Nothing stirred in the dusk save a few trees swaying with ephemeral morning breezes. A deathly silence hung over everything. I walked slowly along the grass, sticking close to the wall of the apartment buildings, peering at every nook and shadow. I kept subconsciously anticipating movement in life, habitually used to this time as a period of awakening and the start of a new day, but the lack of sound or presence only disturbed me further. What had happened here? Where was everyone? Actually, from the smell emanating from my apartment the night before, I imagined many of the families were dead in their marked homes. Was there another me? Dead in my apartment? Not willing to check any of the marked apartments, I crept along toward the front of our development, peering around every corner for several long moments before I made any move. As I moved, I began noticing subtle, inexplicable signs of devastation. A street light had fallen across the outer fence apparently snapped by something that had left the trees around it intact. A van sat pitifully torn in two, as if something had taken a bite clean through the middle. Peering at it from afar, I could see no bodies, or blood, or scorch marks, or anything else that might have indicated how it had happened. My ears strained, and I realized what was missing there were no birds. The morning was alternately still and breezy, but no chirps or calls echoed out from the trees around. Growing increasingly paranoid, I imagined I could feel hollow eyes watching me from every window around, families of corpses within furious that I had dared to creep by their quiet apartments become tombs. Crouching now, I came to the entrance of our apartment complex. Hiding behind a pillar, I looked west into dim blue and darkness, and then east into dim blue and lightening sky. I'd expected crashed cars and decaying bodies and all manner of destruction, but the main road sat empty. The hardware store wasn't far. I decided to risk walking there. We would need tools if we were going to survive a third encounter with the back paths. Darting from cover to cover on the side of the road, I kept looking forward and back but no obvious source of danger presented itself. Crouching back behind a large rock, I looked out and then jumped away from something breathing behind me. I quickly realized it was a dog, but it was in no condition to do anything but breathe. 
A large circular hole had been torn in its stomach and back legs, exposing its inner organs. Slimy and covered in internal goo, they still pulsed with life. The dog rolled its eye and looked at me, giving a pitiful whine of pain. It couldn't speak, but I knew what it wanted. I resolved to return here on my way back once I had an appropriate tool. It was only as I reached the hardware store that I realized that people would have made a run on anything useful if a disaster was looming. But my fears were unfounded. The large building sat undamaged, the front door swinging wide open in the breeze. Now, even more paranoid, I carefully looked around the dusty space from the door, but still saw nothing dangerous. Filling a large bag with anything I thought might be useful, I spent as little time there as possible. The sun cracked the horizon as I began walking back, still on edge. I almost wanted something terrible to happen, if only so I could stop looking over my shoulder constantly. I shaded my eyes against the strangely bright dawn and made for the injured dog. By the time I found his gully again, I began doubting my senses. Blinking, I tried to clear the strangeness, but nothing I did helped. It was only when I saw the dog directly that I realized what I was seeing was not an illusion. Sickly phosphorescence surrounded the animal's open wound, giving off ethereal blue shimmers in response to the dawn's direct sunlight. Staring at it, I could almost see it ever so slowly eating away at his body but his skin and outer flesh far more so than his inner organs. I felt sick, imagining what would happen to him if the strange corruption were allowed to progress. He would live far longer into his horrible death than any living being should have to. A pile of muscles, organs, and inner flesh exposed to the world. Had that happened to the families in all those apartments, too? As the sun grew brighter, so did the eerie phosphorescence. I followed it with my eyes away from the dog, along the ground where he'd dragged himself to get here. And then I saw glimmers of it up in the trees, slowly eating away at intermittent leaves. And it was on the road and variously strewn about on nearby grasses. Looking at myself in terror, I was relieved to find nothing, except... I tore off my jacket, throwing it on the ground. A few shimmering spots of unwholesome blue glimmered on the back, around the bottom. What had I touched? When had my jacket been contaminated? What the hell was it? Poking the jacket with a stick, I confirmed that small frayed holes had been eaten in the material. Truly horrified to my core for the first time since I'd encountered the back paths, I wasted nearly a minute standing in place. What could consume street lights, vans, dogs, trees, grass, and jackets alike? Was this what the posted warning signs had been referring to? The rumble I'd heard that morning. I could now fathom the sound. It had to have been a nearby building collapsing, its foundations likely eaten right through. Checking my bag of tools for contamination, I took off running as soon as I was satisfied that they were clean. I ran through the apartment complex in terror, changing my route constantly to avoid large patches of shimmering blue. Somehow, on my way out before dawn, I'd managed to walk a narrow, invisible passage of safety. 
eerie corruption ate away at the sidewalks I'd avoided, and I could now see it smeared on door handles and the sides of cars and anything else infected people had touched before, before their skin had. I shook my head, fighting the urge to be sick. The apartment we'd taken refuge in remained normal in appearance, free of the strange consumption for the moment. I silently thanked whoever had nailed the warning signs to every other home. As I opened the front door, I froze. I'd opened my own apartment door the night before. The door handles. Staring at my hands, I studied them for any sign of corruption but breathed a sigh of relief when I found none. Had I just used the key to open and close the door? I couldn't remember. Fishing my keys out of my pocket, I held them up. A slight sliver of blue glowed from within one of the deeper grooves. Throwing them away in disgust, I pulled out my pocket, making sure it hadn't spread to my clothes. Satisfied, I bolted inside, announcing myself as I ran up the stairs. Come on, come outside, we have to go. Mike emerged after a moment, holding the little girl in his arms at the top of the stairs. What is it? What's happened? I can't even explain it, I shouted back. Just don't touch anything glowing blue. Seriously, do not let it touch you. Why? What happens? I shook my head and led them outside, checking them over in the sunlight. You're clean. We ran to the gap to the back paths, finding refuge in a wide swath of untouched grass immediately outside the entrance. It was strange that I felt safe there, but at the moment the world at large seemed far worse than whatever new nightmare awaited us within. What's that? The little girl asked smiling and pointing at the shimmering phosphorescence all around. Nothing, Mike said calmly, holding her in place. Just decorations. Christmas lights. I wonder if he guessed the horrific things that glimmering corruption could do to living beings. How was he still so calm? I laid out the tools I'd grabbed, studying our options. We had to come up with a plan. If the back paths just turned upside down the moment we entered, we would die. Unless... I lifted the length of rope I'd grabbed, my manic smile a momentary triumph returning. Forget running the maze. We have to do something it won't expect. We're gonna climb. Chapter, Chapter 4, four. Games, Games End I knew we were in serious trouble the moment I opened my eyes. What is it? Mike asked, his eyes still closed, his hands on the rope between us. The little girl clung to his back, tied in place. She didn't seem to have any idea that we were in danger. We're in. I responded, studying our surroundings with a sinking heart. The back paths had anticipated our rope response and taken things a step beyond simply dumping us into endless sky. The tree-lined path still extended away from us, but it dropped off sharply a few feet away. A thick cube sat just further than that, trees and sidewalk running up its side, across it, and down again. Paths split off from there across floating geometric shapes, barely connected at impossible angles. 
filling the sky with mind-bending paths leading in every direction. Below, the maze seemed to stretch on in an endless jumble of shapes, stretching all the way to a fading horizon miles distant. What had once been confusing claustrophobic paths had now become an entire endless labyrinth, a plane unto itself. I'm way too sober for this, Mike commented, his tone heavy with the first note of true despair I'd ever heard him utter. Walking to the edge that dropped off the side of our current cube, studying the trees that stood straight out without a problem, I probed the void with my foot. As I'd suspected, instead of falling straight down, I began curving over the corner, eventually coming to a stop at a 90 degree angle to my former position. What, what if, if it, it just, just drops, drops us? us? Mike called, hesitant to step into the new angle. I looked around the endless sky maze, curious. I don't know. Maybe it doesn't have control that specific with so much effort spent on all... this. But we don't have a choice anyway. The faint last notes of a massive roar echoed around us, made only more terrifying by their sheer distant origin. Had something on the horizon seen us? I thought I saw movement on a distant upside-down pyramid, but peering into the jumble of shapes and shadows brought no answers. Moving quickly along quickly changing angles, walking around a massive sphere of tree-lined sidewalks, and stepping onto a slowly rotating rectangle of grass, we came to a picnic table next to a five-by-five five pool of water soaked red with blood. A body lay within, disturbingly normal by its clothes and lack of any horrible features. Mike kept his distance so as not to scare the little girl. I broke off a stick from a nearby tree and turned him over. He looked vaguely familiar, perhaps somebody else that lived in our apartment complex. Were others stumbling into the back paths, too? It didn't seem unlikely now that I thought about it. We'd angered it by continually defying it and made it increasingly deadly. Narrowing my eyes, I looked over at my companions. How had that little girl survived in here for so long by herself? Suddenly doubting my current perspective, I checked under the picnic table and found the letter I'd carved last iteration. Something seemed to move to my right and I looked out across vast, incomprehensible spaces. The light was changing slowly, the change more clear on rotating hedrons. Looking up, I realized the sun was still up there, somewhere, moving as normal, even as I wondered about the ever-present rain in the maze, the first drops began to fall one hitting my cheek with a forceful splatter. What do we do? Mike asked. I don't even see any nearby gaps. Ours could be miles away, and how will we ever find it? It's a long shot, I thought aloud, but we broke a hole in our gap last time we were here. If that's still there, once the water reaches a certain height, it should start flowing that way, right? A small light of hope entered his eyes. Holy crap, I think you're right. It'll be tough to notice with all... this. He indicated the insane geometry of the twisted world around us. But it might work, as long as we don't head back to the last world by accident. I said with a shrug. Broke a hole in that gap, too. I probably shouldn't have said that. He seemed worried again, 
leading the way as the light-scattered drops became a full drizzle. I picked what seemed like the most confusing direction and headed that way, assuming the maze would try to lead us away from our exit by putting easy misdirections in our way. I opted to remain roped together in case any of the angles simply dropped me as Mike had feared. Curving up around a large parabolic structure, we came to a position directly above our previous spot. Looking straight up, we could see the bloody pool upside down above us. Narrowing my eyes, I thought I saw movement again. Shaking my head, I dismissed it until I looked up again. This time, the ravaged body we'd turned over was gone, leaving the pool splashing with its departure. Staring at the trees all around that pool, I tried to figure out where it went, but the foliage was too thick. Mike noticed too, and without another word, we began hurrying away. The increasing patter of the rain became enormously loud, splattering against leaves in every direction in the vast, endless maze. No matter where we went, it was always coming down at us, and we could see the drops traveling sideways and up and down in the distance. There! Mike shouted, pointing at a gigantic cylinder behind and above us. Bloody handprints trailed the slowly spinning surface. Studying the rain flows in the air, I realized we could evade the animated corpse with a little shortcut. Here, I said, climbing up a specific tree. Mike was forced to follow by the short length of rope between us, and we both moved up alongside a strange stucco wall. A weird growling sound echoed from around the corner of our current cube. I hit the changing rain flow as the corpse thing rounded the corner, crawling at impossible speed toward our tree. Feeling my hair lifting straight up, blood rushing to my head, I knew my instinct had been right. Leaping straight up, I suddenly turned upside down and hung painfully from the rope tied around my waist. Looking down, I saw another tree just below my feet. Reaching out, I gripped it with the flats of my shoes, pulling Mike up, or down, as it were. He spun in the air, but managed to land lightly in the branches with my help, the little girl on his back laughing. Above us, the mauled corpse hung from the tree upside down a few feet away, its legs mere stubs of cracked bone. It lacked the ability to jump. Staring at us with hollow eyes, it began descending its tree, moving up and away from us, intent on crawling down another path. Go! I shouted, climbing down as fast as I could without placing my hands on branches I'd stepped on, with Mike just behind me doing the same. The surging rain had made the climb treacherous, and I deemed another such stunt impossible. It would be all running from here as we hit the ground and took off up the side of a mountainous pyramid. That incredible roar sounded again, shaking the very bricks beneath our shoes. We crested the pyramid our view opening up on a mighty valley of open space above and below, a sky arena stretching to the very horizon framed by a universe of jumbled polyhedrons permeated by incongruous blasting rains. We froze in place from sheer awe and terror. A thing of horrible beauty approached through the sky, passing through wide swaths of sunlight, rain, and shadow, moving of its own volition, bearing no visible manner of proportion.
compulsion. It simply was. It simply moved in all shapes and directions, writhing with rotting vitality, and it had most definitely seen us. Running felt pointless, but we did it anyway. Trying to duck deeper into the maze, animal panic took over, leading us deeper into the jumble. A sense of sight passed over us several times, a vast awareness searching for us in the darkening underbelly of the labyrinth. I closed my eyes against the overwhelming feeling each time, but kept running, knowing the rope would keep Mike from getting lost. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. <laughs> The massive, unholy thing tore away at the hedrons above us, simply consuming them. The shadows around us lessened as we ran, until that horrible awareness stopped in place. It had found us. Paralyzed, we turned and looked up. Shivering eddies seemed to tug at the edges of my very consciousness. Vaporous memories and emotions leaving through the corners of my eyes, grasping at them. I tried to keep them, tried to hold on to those scant, precious moments from my childhood, but they sifted through my fingers like so much sand, drawing further vitality along behind them. Screaming, I used up all of my strength just to close my eyes. I bent over, and then fell to my hands and knees, something dripping along my face. I felt gravity shift, and the air move as a gargantuan presence moved toward us, a vile limb reaching out, perhaps to destroy us, perhaps to regard us, perhaps to consume us. Eyes still closed tightly, I tugged at my shoelaces, my fingers straining at the wet material. Finally, I got one shoe off. Feeling the surging air reach a peak as the thing began to close around us, I threw my shoe in the air as hard as I could, laughing like a maniac. <laughs> You shouldn't have shown yourself. <laughs> All destructive motion ceased. Opening my blood dripping eyes, I looked first to Mike, who sat curled on his knees with his hands over his face. The little girl waved at me, oblivious. Narrowing my eyes, I turned my attention up where the monster thing regarded me with one infinite black void of what I presumed to be an eye. I could feel it massaging the meat inside my head, pulling out what we had done. It didn't matter. Nothing mattered. It was too late. The shifting sun finally reached us, illuminating our real strategy. Ethereal blue phosphorescence glowed from the bottoms of our shoes and everywhere that we had stepped throughout the maze. A small glimmer even radiated from a half shoe print on the impossible monstrous limb still hovering above us. <laughs> it's going to eat you, I shouted, <laughs> laughing and comforting around with wild eyes. It's going to eat everything here. Glorwalk, Glorwalk, Glorwalk. <laughs> For the first time, 
the entity behind the back paths felt something other than hunger. I could feel it rejecting my assertion, its void eye regarding the incredible size of its domain. No! Nope. I yelled, grinning, thinking of the letter I'd carved into one picnic table, then seen on all the rest. I think this place isn't really as big as it looks. Giving another moment for a self-indulgent whirl and maniacal laughter, I spread my arms wide. Let us go, and I'll tell you how to cure it. We sat at a tense, unholy impasse. Regarding the widening blue glow on its limb, I pointed. It's spreading. Can you feel it? What's it feel like? Does it feel like dying, or does it feel like nothing at all? Absolute void encroaching on your senses. <laughs> Next to me, Mike watched me with horror, more afraid of me than of the entity hovering above us. A third and final massive roar blasted us with fetid, ghastly odors. The sound of grating brick erupted behind us, and the blue wire we'd lain last iteration shimmered into view under our feet. Of course, I mused aloud. Mostly illusion. We kicked off our shoes, leaving the eerie blue corruption in the entity's pocket dimension, where the consumption would be contained safely. Walking through the gap in bare socks, we emerged into a carport parking lot. A neighbor stood in the distance, smoking in just a beater and boxers. Well, we're definitely home, Mike said with a gulp. Yes. I turned regarding the back paths. I could still feel the entity's presence, awaiting the promised cure. I wondered how long it would take to realize no cure was coming. What did it really look like? Did it have skin that would sloth off before it died, leaving it to waste away in agony? I hoped so. Mike began stepping away nervously. I'm just gonna take her home. I'll, I'll do it. Trust me. He untied her ropes and let her down, pushing her over to me. She leapt up into my arms without a care. I began walking away, a deeply satisfying sense of victory filling me. The screams of little girls playing in the carport emanated from down the lot. Looking over... I saw the missing girl watched over worriedly by her mother as she played. So they'd found her after all, through normal means. I smiled at the little girl I was holding. It hadn't seen the real little girl playing in the distance yet, but the jig was about to be up. I wondered, with excitement, how it would try to defend itself. Would it be as much fun as the back paths had been? What are you? Mike called after me, his tone quavering. Don't worry about it, I called back, walking away. It was rare that I left witnesses alive, but he'd been a top-notch partner. It wouldn't have felt right to destroy him. No... Right at that moment, I was only looking forward to taking the imposter creature into the apartment I'd been temporarily making use of, and then seeing how well it might fight back. Two kills in one day. What a week. My grin widened as I departed. I'm nobody. 
Just remember me as a bad trick you had once. Well, talk about an unreliable narrator, hmm? Seems there was more to our protagonist than he was letting on about. At least he was a good sport with Mike there. Too bad we won't find out more about him or whatever it was that little doppelganger girl was. She did seem awfully calm while faced with mortal danger. Well... If you're curious about Matt Dimersky's multiverse stories, you can find his novels and compilations online. I'll be sure to link them in the show notes. Well, kitties, I am afraid that is all for the evening. Best to turn in now and sleep out the rest of the storm. <laughs> Alas, my friends, the time has come. I do believe our tales are done. I'll dim the lights and prepare for night. Have pleasant dreams and do sleep tight. <laughs> The Mad Catter Presents Twisted Tea Time is copyright 2016 by Z.P. Gowdy. All stories are the properties of their respective authors and are obtained via direct permission, creative commons, or their simply public domain. Twisted Tea Time is executively produced for RenegadeRadio.com by Charlie Renegade. And you can listen to Twisted Tea Time on RenegadeRadio.com Saturday nights at 9 o'clock p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Support Twisted Tea Time by subscribing to us on Patreon at patreon.com slash themadcatter. Music for Twisted Tea Time is used courtesy of Kevin McLeod at incompetech.com, as well as Jason White, whose work can be found at soundcloud.com slash angels of dash despair. Details can be found in the show notes. If you want more of me and my mischief, find my charming grin on facebook.com slash Cheshire Hat or on Twitter at Real Mad Catter. Download past episodes from SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash Cheshire Hat or visit me at www.themadcatter.net. Good night, kitties. Pleasant dreams. <laughs>